Oh Lord, we do indeed give you praise and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. We thank you that in him there is salvation, there is restoration, there is hope, there is chance for a new start. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon our thoughts this morning as we look into this portion of your word, the life of Elijah. We pray that you would instruct us, Lord, that we would, uh, your Holy Spirit would be free to work in our hearts this morning. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God has a purpose for your life. He has a reason for creating each one of us the way he did. Everything about you, everything that happens to you, has a part to play in making you the kind of person God wants you to be. Things like where you were born, where you were brought up, your family, where you went to school, the innate talents that you were born with, or the skills that you kind of developed as you, you grew as you grew up, where you live, your neighbors, your family, you know, whether or not you've been brought up in a good church, all of these things play a part in making you who you are. And many of these things you've got no control over. It's how you learn to deal with them that matters. Sooner or later in life, we'll all face tragedy or difficulty of one sort or another. And often we have no choice in the things that happen to us. But we do have a choice when it comes to how we respond. This is where having a relationship with the Lord can make all the difference. We live in a sin-cursed world. Bad things are going to happen. But when they do, we can turn to God and trust God in Him to help us get through. Or we can turn our backs. We can turn and walk away and we can let negative feelings dominate our lives. Now last week, we left Elijah under the juniper tree. You remember he received a note from Jezebel, the queen. She threatened to kill him. And he turned tail and ran as far as he could go. Now he's in the wilderness. In the south, all alone. He's not in a good place. He's depressed, even suicidal. Look at what he said in verse 4. He says, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. He clearly wasn't thinking straight. Now, the thing about Elijah is that he should have known better. Elijah had been faithful to obey God for many years. And throughout all the years of drought, throughout the famine conditions that followed, all the time that he had been in the wilderness before, God had kept him. God had kept him safe. God had provided for him miraculously through all those years. But in a moment, Elijah seems to have forgotten all of that. One note from a wicked queen, and he ran for his life. Perhaps deep down now Elijah was feeling like a failure. Perhaps he couldn't see how he could get out of his predicament. Perhaps he felt like his worth wasn't worth his life wasn't worth living anymore. You know, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves in a similar place. Backed into circumstances. Maybe circumstances not of our choosing. But either way, we can't see a way out. We get to thinking it's all over, that we can't go on. But of course, our vision is limited. We can't see into the future. We can't see what lies ahead. But God does. God is not limited in the way we are. God is all-knowing. He can see the future. He knows what lies ahead. And what's more, God is able to do the things that you and I never could. God is all-powerful. Remember the promise of God's Word that all things work together for good to those who love God. He can take the bad things of life as well as the good things and use them all to realize His purposes in you. If you let Him. If you trust Him and let Him have His way, in your life. Well, he was Elijah. He was alone in the wilderness and feeling about as low as a person could feel. But God wasn't finished with him yet. God has something to say to him. 
If only Elijah will listen and do what God asks. In fact, if Elijah trusts himself to God, he'll discover that far from it all being over, his ministry was actually just about to begin. So let's pick up our story where we left off last week. It's verse 4. We've learned that Elijah himself had gone a day's journey in the wilderness. He came and sat down under a juniper tree, juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise or a bottle of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Already we see God has further plans for Elijah. The angel tells the prophet, Get up and eat something, have something to drink. Why? Well, because the journey you're about to take is a big one. Do what you have to do to take care of yourself because you've got places to go and things to do. You know, I think there's some wisdom here for us, even in this small detail. When you're feeling overwhelmed by life, when you don't know where to turn, when you feel like you're running away from it all, do the little things. Forget about the bigger picture for a moment. Just take care of yourself. Get some sleep. Then get up and take a shower. Have something to eat and drink. Take care of the little things, the little everyday things that we know about. The little things that are within our power. The little things that we can do and ought to be done. And learn to leave the rest with God. He's far more able to deal with the bigger picture than you are anyway. He can see the bigger picture that you can't. Besides, it doesn't all rest on your shoulders anyways. It never did. Here's the reality of Elijah's situation. Despite his own failures and shortcomings, God was not finished. Elijah had gone about a day's journey into the wilderness and said he'd had enough. Now God leads Elijah even farther into the wilderness. Another 40 days journey into the wilderness. It's almost as if God was saying to Elijah, okay, so you want to be in the wilderness? Let's go then. Let's do it your way. Let's just see how far into the wilderness you're willing to go before you're ready to listen to what I have to say to you. By the way, did you notice the number of days and nights uh, uh, that Elijah was to journey? That's right, 40. 40 days and 40 nights. If you know your Bible, you've seen that number before. How many times have we seen God deliberately leading his people into the wilderness for just such a period of time? Remember the story of the Israelites, was it when they came out, the, uh, out of Egypt and out of slavery? It took them 40 years before they were finally ready, before they finally got the place where they needed to be so that God could take them into the promised land. 40 years. And then there was Jesus. Before he began his public ministry, remember that the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness where he was alone for 40 days and 40 nights. The number 40 appears more than 150 times in the Bible. 40 years is the period of a generation. When the Bible speaks of a generation, it's 40 years worth of time. But 40 can also represent a time of testing, a time of preparation, a time of proving getting ready for what is yet to come. Well, this journey deep in the wilderness was a journey that Elijah needed to take. It got him away from the place of his failure. It got him away from the other things that might distract him to a place where he was alone, just with God. He got him to a place where he was finally ready to listen to what God had to say to him, to hear what he needed to hear from God. And there are more lessons here for us. You know, when God asks you to do something, He'll prepare you for it. He'll see to it that you have what you need to accomplish His will. Matthew Henry, the great Welsh commentator of the Bible, had this to say about Elijah's experience. God knows what He designs us for, that we be furnished with grace sufficient. 
He that appoints what that voyage will be will victual the ship accordingly. See how many different ways God took to keep Elijah alive. He fed him with ravens, then with multiplied meals, then by an angel, and now to show that man lives not by bread alone, he keeps him alive for 40 days without meat, continually traversing the mazes of the desert. Sometimes it's God's plan for us to go into the wilderness. We have this idea that life should always be bright and sunny with never a cloud in the sky. And then when the first cloud comes <coughs> and it blots out the sun and it casts its shadow over us, we think something's wrong. That maybe God is upset with us about something or that he's judging us in some way. That God's being unfair. And what we have to realize is, is that hardship isn't always a sign of God's displeasure or of his chastening hand. Sometimes God leads us into the wilderness because it's for our own good. God has something he desires to do for us there that can't be achieved anywhere else. Perhaps as it was in Elijah's case, it's a time of preparation for something more, for something that lies yet ahead. <coughs> Elijah had at first been the one to take himself into the wilderness. But now that he's there, God decides to use it to teach him a lesson. Perhaps, like Elijah, you slipped in your life. You feel the test, or you feel like you feel the test. Realize God's not finished. He's not finished with you yet. He's the God of the impossible. There's nothing you can do to put yourself beyond the ability of God to work in your life. <coughs> except perhaps when you stop trusting Him. You know when someone lets you down, sometimes the easiest thing in the world to do is just to walk away. I've had enough of might say, you're on your own. But that's not how God operates. God doesn't give up on His children. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 gives us this wonderful promise that he which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the angel comes to Elijah and tells him to arise and eat. And here we see an example of God's amazing grace. How he cared for his prophet in his time of need. We see God's special provision in providing him with sufficient food and drink for his physical needs. We see God's special messenger in sending an angel from heaven to care for Elijah. And now we'll see God's special instruction for the prophet. Instruction designed especially for Elijah in his time of need. God is love. We see it in everything that he does. He loves his children and he delights in their well-being. He wants the best for you, and He will stop at nothing to bring you to the place where He can re realize His best in your life. And sometimes, that may mean His having to take us into the wilderness. God's not like us. He doesn't take the huff. He doesn't turn His back on us when we stumble and fall. But we need Him most. There's a sense in which God's love for us has less to do with us anyways than what we've done, and a whole lot more to do with His Son, the Lord Jesus. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have existed together in love from eternity past. And in the supreme act of love, Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world and gave His life for us. Every blessing that we enjoy from God, we enjoy because of Jesus. <coughs> I'm going to read just a few verses from Ephesians chapter 1 in this thought. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. According as He has chosen us in Him from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. In love, having predestined us to the adoption of children, through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Are you in Christ? 
Do you know what that means? Have you personally, consciously come to Jesus in faith and committed your life to Him as Savior and Lord? Does Jesus know you as one of His own? Every promise, every blessing God has in store for you comes yours when you become, belong to Jesus. You commit your life to Him. If you're not sure where you stand with God, if you feel like you're still sitting on the fence, then my advice to you is this. Don't hesitate a moment longer. Come to Jesus and come to Him now. There's nothing to be gained from holding out against the one who loves you and gave himself for you. Back to our story. Here's Elijah. He arose in verse 8, and he ate, and he drank, and then he went in the strength of that food for the next 40 days and 40 nights until he came to Horeb, the Mount of God. And he came to a cave and lodged there. Notice where Elijah has come to. It's Horeb, the Mount of God. Now this is not the first time this place has been mentioned in the Bible. The first time we come across this place is in the book of Exodus. It's the very same place where Moses saw the burning bush. It's the same place where later God will give the Ten Commandments to Moses. You might say, well wait a minute, wasn't that Mount Sinai? Well yes, yeah, you'd be right. But the scriptures seems to use these two names interchangeably for the same mountain. Sometimes it's called Sinai, sometimes it's called Horeb. Either way, Elijah now finds himself in the very same place where God once met with Moses and spoke to him there. And Elijah finds a cave on that mountain and takes shelter there after his long journey. Now wouldn't it be an interesting coincidence if that were the very same cave where Moses had sheltered all those years before when God in all his glory had passed by then. God asks Elijah a question in verse 9. He says to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? There's a reason why God asks him the question. He's getting Elijah to answer. He's getting Elijah to confess or confront what he's done. There's a sense in which restoration can't take place until the prophet is willing to acknowledge where he'd gone wrong and on his need for God's help. And you know the same is true for us still today? Unless you're willing to acknowledge you've got a problem and need help, there's little anyone else can do for you. As long as you stubbornly hold out, thinking, I can sort this out on my own, there's little God can do for you, or at least he will do for you. Anyone who's ever suffered from an addiction can tell you that's how it goes. You can go to the most expensive rehab center and be given the best treatment available and have the experts deal with it. But unless you are determined, deep within, to make a change, at the first chance you get, you'll slip right back into old ways. Now God is there for you. He has the will to bless you. He's told that in, the word, in His Word. But God will not force His blessing on an unwilling soul. It will be an exercise in futility, and God knows it. This is the prophet. It's, there's a proverb in the Old Testament that puts it rather bluntly. As the dog returns to his vomit, so the fool returns to his folly. And as a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. So the first thing God does here in our story is to get Elijah to face up to his own mistake. To get him to confess the error of his ways. It has to be done this way. Confession, admitting that you've done wrong, that's the path to restoration. That's where healing begins. Well, Elijah starts to talk. Notice how Elijah answers. Verse 10, he says, I, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, but they, the children of Israel, well, they've forsaken your covenant, they throw down your altars, and they've slain their prophets with a sword, but I, even I only, am left. There's not much confession there, is there? 
he kind of just starts throwing the blame around. He blames everyone but himself for the predicament he now finds himself in. He's still not yet to the place where he needs to be. So God decides to turn the heat up, so to speak. Look at verse 11. God says, well, Elijah, go forth and stand out there on the mountain before the Lord. And then we're told the Lord passed by the great and strong wind that shook the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake either. And then after the earthquake, there was a fire, but still the Lord was not in the fire. Elijah needs a lesson. He's not getting the picture. So God tells Elijah to go stand at the mouth of the cave. I'm actually not sure that Elijah does what he's told. Because it seems not until verse 13 does he actually get up and go and stand in the mouth of the cave. But while he's there, feeling sorry for himself in the cave, God passes by. And in his wake, there's a powerful whirlwind that comes blowing through the mountains. It whips up the dust and it loosens the rocks so that they begin to tumble down the mountainside. It must have been an awesome sight to behold. And then the earth begins to quake. I've never been in an earthquake, but I can imagine there'd be few things more terrifying than when the ground beneath you begins to move. And then last but not least, a raging fire sweeps across the mountain. Now isn't that interesting? What was the last thing Elijah had done before he panicked and ran? He'd been on Mount Carmel, if you remember, where God had sent fire down from heaven in response to Elijah's prayer. It's almost as if God is taking Elijah back, reminding him where he once was. Elijah has just experienced three spectacular natural events. Even terrifying to behold, awesome demonstrations of power. And yet the scripture tells us God wasn't in any of it. And it repeats the phrase after each event, but the Lord was not in it. So what's the point in all this? God was clearly the cause of everything that had just happened, but God wasn't present in any of it. <coughs> At the end of the day, what had Elijah seen? A whirlwind, an earthquake, and a fire. But the one thing he hadn't seen was God. I think there's some important lessons here for us. Lessons about God and how He operates. Lessons for us here about His power, His presence, and His care for us. And that's where our thoughts will come to a close this morning. Firstly, God's power. Do you remember when the disciples were in the boat in the middle of a storm? And to their amazement, Jesus spoke and the seas were calm. Disciples had first been confronted with their own helplessness. It was only in their desperation when they tried everything else that they finally turned to Jesus. And only then did he act to deliver them. What he did completely confounded their expectations. Because of that experience, the disciples had come to see Jesus in a whole new light, in a way they might not otherwise have ever seen him, had they not gone through that storm. But because of that terrifying experience, they'd been driven to the point where they had to acknowledge their own helplessness, their own ability to save themselves. And so they cried out to him for help. Now, why did Elijah need to be impressed with the mighty power of God? Didn't he know about it already? Well, of course he did. After all, Elijah had essentially survived the last three and a half years of his life because God daily, miraculously provided for him. But he seems to have forgotten it all when he got the Queen's note. And so he needed to be reminded of God's power. Or maybe there was just another lesson Elijah needed to learn. Perhaps because, precisely because of the fact over the last three years, he had been uh, survived because of the miracles. He'd gotten to depend on the miraculous to get him through. The miraculous had almost become commonplace. He might have even begun to take it all for granted. The miraculous had become something of a crutch, 
almost a bit like a drug. And he required ever more demonstrations of God's miraculous power to get him through. But what he hadn't realized is that he began to rely on the evidence of the miraculous rather than on God himself. He was not as spiritually strong and self-sufficient as he thought he was. So much so that when the first crisis came, his faith crumbled. Now, never forget, God's in control. He is the one who sends the whirlwind and the earthquake and the fire. But here's the question for us, for me and for you this morning. Can we trust God even when he's not in the whirlwind and the earthquake and the fire? And I just need to learn something more about the power of God. God can do anything. But sometimes God chooses not to act in the way, at least in the way we think he should. God isn't there just to perform miracles on demand whenever we want them. God's not there to perform to meet our expectations. Elijah needed to learn to trust God even when there seemed to be no miracles. Elisha needed to learn something more about God's presence. God is always with his people. With or without the evidence of his miraculous power, God had not forsaken Elijah. It was Elijah who had forsaken God when he had run away in fear. God's presence is with us at all times. And God was there with Elijah when he got the note from the queen that threatened to take his life. <coughs> It's as another Bible scholar has said, God knows the need of every Christian. He knows when that frightening letter arrives, the note of dismissal from work, the news of an accident, or sickness, or death. He knows, he cares, and he will supply. God not only knows all about our troubles, but he also cares. Our, res our resources are limited. We must use them wisely and sparingly, but God's not so. His resources are infinite. He will not refuse his children when they are in need. He will not deprive you of his care in the hour of trial. No expense is too great for the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? Matthew chapter 6, he tells us not to worry. He says, your heavenly Father knows what you have need of. So don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. But we've got to realize, God doesn't dispense his grace just for the sake of it. God is not a performer to entertain us on demand or to seek our applause. God will ever only act when it serves to bring Him glory in some way. When it will accomplish His purposes in you. When it will help to accomplish His will. So God caused the whirlwind. He caused the earthquake and the fire to come, but He wasn't in any of it. And now that he's got Elijah's attention, look what happens at the end of verse 12. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he finally wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. <coughs> Behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I asked him the same question all over again. After all the noise and tumult, there was stillness. And in the quiet, with nothing to distract, God speaks to him in a still, small voice. Elijah had been thinking in terms of the big and the showy, high drama of great contests and mighty demonstrations of power. And when that didn't bring the results that he was expecting, he was ready to quit and die. But now, only after all the noise and the tumult has passed by, and all is quiet and still, only now does God choose to speak. There's a lesson here for us. We live in a world that craves the dramatic. People are dazzled and seduced by loud noises and bright lights. They live from one adrenaline high to the next. 
But God's normal method of operation is not in the spectacular. Jesus said it's the wicked and adulterous generation that seeks a sign. But in contrast, the Bible tells us that it's the work, the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteous, righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 encourages us to aim to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we have instructed you. Elijah's attitude was rooted in his pride. He was relying on the big moment to get him through. And when things took a turn for the worse, his faith crumbled and he ran. And similarly, I believe there's a lot of people today who are craving or longing for the big, the sensational, but it's an unhealthy desire and it's rooted in the same source, in our pride. People are desperately grasping for attention for themselves. They're desperate to be noticed when all along true fulfillment comes in our giving glory to God. Though little more is said about Elijah after this in the Bible, yet he still had, we learn, another ten years or so of ministry before God finally took him home to heaven. Look what the Lord said to him in, in verse 15. He said, go, go back, go back by way of Damascus. And when you come there, anoint Hazel to be the king over Syria. And then Jehu, you anoint him to be king over Israel. And then anoint Elisha to be your successor as prophet. And then he reminds Elijah at the very end of it, you're not the only one left. I have left 7,000 in Israel. All the knees who have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Elijah did, to his credit, he did as he was told. He returned to the kingdom of Israel. He spent the remainder of his life ministering to the spiritual needs of the nation, particularly those 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to false gods. Elijah stood for the rest of his life as a light pointing the people back to the one true and living God. If Elijah hadn't responded humbly and obediently to God's call, God could have used someone else. There was Elisha waiting in the wings. We learn later on of another prophet, the prophet Micaiah, who lived at the same time, and he too stood courageously for the Lord. And then, of course, there were the 7,000. God could have used one of them to do his bullying, his bidding. But God chose Elijah. Elijah was the man of God's choosing. Elijah was the one perfectly suited to accomplish the tasks that God had in mind for him to do. Someone has said, God's call should never be taken lightly. When he calls, he wants the one he calls. Each of us, each one of us, has tasks with a name on it, with your name on it. God wants that person to perform it. It might be a Sunday school class, a church office, or a life's call to the ministry. But the one who God has in mind for each task, he wants to fulfill it. So here's the thought for us at the end of all this today. God has a specific task for each one of us to do. A task with your name on it. Do you know what God wants you to do for his glory? Are you prepared to do what God asks you to do? Are you willing to step outside of your comfort zone? To be counted for God. Maybe there's someone here today who needs to take that first step of obedience. Come to Christ and commit your life to Him as Savior and Lord. Or perhaps God is speaking to you about some area of ministry or service, something that you can do for God. Perhaps it's to help a teach a Sunday school class or, or lead a Bible study. Maybe it's about using your musical talents and the worship of the Lord or Perhaps you've got some practical skills to offer. A ministry in prayer, or hospitality, or encouragement. Maybe there's a family member or a friend that you need to speak to about Jesus. Whatever it might be, are you willing to give your service to the Lord? Don't keep putting it off till another day. What cannot be done today can be fatal to your spiritual life. And don't be the one who covets the limelight. That's not where the blessing lies. But rather, let's be content just to be obedient. To serve the Lord, no matter what the task. Not seeking the attention and glory for ourselves, but content if only we're able in some way 
to bring glory to Jesus, <coughs> our Saviour and the Lord. All right, just a few thoughts then from the experience of Elijah. I said a lot this morning, if there's something that I've said today that's raised a concern or a question in your own heart and mind, you would happy to talk with you further. As always, you can leave today knowing that all is well between you and your Lord. Will if you come and lead us in a final day?